We're a precision oncology company, Rain Therapeutics, based in the San Francisco Bay Area, focused on, on novel therapies for cancer patients, uh, but using a biomarker-based strategy. My name is Avanish Falunki, co-founder and CEO, um, founded Rain back in 2017, along with my co-founder, Dr. Bob Doble, uh, a preeminent name in the world of precision oncology. Um, and uh, our lead program for Rain Therapeutics is, is this oral small molecule uh, inhibitor of MDM2, and that's a target, uh, that's a focus, uh, and a drug called Meladematan. And this is a program that we licensed in from Daiichi Senkyo uh, in the second half of last year. So the area of, of biology where Meladematan is relevant is in this MDM2 P53 axis. So taking a step back, P53 is a very important transcription factor in all of our cells. It's, uh, it's called the guardian of the genome. And so it's, it's a good thing we want a lot of it around. It's what detects injury in the cell and tells the cell to stop, stop growing or to kill itself, ultimately induce apoptosis. So it's a tremendous regulator of overall proliferation in our normal cells. Now cancer, uh, cancer can arise through a variety of mechanisms. And one of the primary, primary mechanisms is by addressing this P53 because cancer has got to get rid of it. Uh, cancer is not going to be able to grow and, and proliferate if P53 is doing its job. So really, it's, it's P53 and making sure that P53 is active uh, and protective, which is the role ultimately of our, of our program. So P53 can be removed by cancer in a couple of ways. One, the cancer cells could uh, mutate P53, so they can't do what it's supposed to do. As a transcription factor, P53 binds DNA and leads to a variety of downstream protective uh, uh, factors. And so if P53 is mutated, it can't, it can't do that. So P53 mutations are implicated in about 50% of all cancers. So P53 mutations is one way that the cancer cells get rid of, of uh, P53. Another way is by upregulating or using MDM2 to effectively remove P53. So MDM2 in its normal function regulates P53. So when MDM2 binds to P53, P53 can't do what it's supposed to do. It can't bind to DNA, it can't lead to all those downstream uh, protective factors. So when MDM2 binds P53, it locks up P53. And in fact, MDM2 also marks P53 for degradation. So it could actually facilitate the, the physical removal of P53 from the cell through degradation. So the, the strategy of our drug is if we can block MDM2, then MDM2 can't lock up P53. So in a way we're, we're reactivating normal P53 to go about its day and doing what it's supposed to do to protect the cell. So by inhibiting MDM2, we restore wild type P53 activity. And so that's, uh, that's addressing the other way that cancers can, can remove P P53. So in the other half of cancers, where there is no mutation in P53, uh, you've got normal P53 that, that is bound up to uh, MDM2. So we're trying, to, we're trying to go after that 50% of cancer market where there's no mutation in P53. Um, so our drug is a, again, small molecule oral inhibitor of MDM2. Uh, we licensed this program late last year. And what really struck us as compelling about this specific program was while MDM2 inhibition has been around before and other programs have tried, uh, there is a specific toxicity that has plagued um, all prior generation MDM2 inhibitors. And that is the blood toxicities, the cytopenias. We all have MDM2 in our normal blood cells and our normal hematopoietic cells. And so a normal on-target toxicity of MDM2 inhibition is low platelets, uh, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, anemia, these are the standard toxicities you get from inhibiting MDM2. Uh, but one of the things that we've seen from the industry um, and other competing programs is that, that many of those MDM2 programs hang around for a very long time in the body, even after you stop dosing, and they tend to accumulate in tissues. So if they accumulate in tissues, then once a patient stops taking drug, that, that therapy is continuing to lead to those toxicities. And if they continue to lead to those toxicities, patients aren't able to fully recover. And the lack of recovery means ultimately patients may be dose reduced, they may ultimately be discontinued from therapy because of that, that safety issue. And uh, a surefire way to lose the benefit of, of any sort of therapy for cancer is for patients to take less of it or to stop taking the drug entirely. So finding a dose schedule that balances 
activity, but also makes it safe and tolerable for patients, that schedule has been the holy grail of, of, of finding an effective MDM2 inhibitor. This specific program that we licensed from Daiichi has this benefit where it does not accumulate in tissues. And because there is no accumulation, patients can clear the drug out pretty quickly. So that makes the dose schedule management far more uh, attainable. And Daiichi Sankyo did this work and we won't take credit for this, but they came up with a specific dose schedule, a specific dose schedule where patients take the therapy for three days, uh, once a day, and they're off drug for 11 days, that's two weeks. And during those three days where they're on drug, they can get to a high drug level in, in, in blood, induce cancer cell death. But then when they're off drug, the patients clear out the drug and any sort of toxicities resolve before they go back on drug. So that balance ultimately led to an overall safety profile of this drug that we believe is far better than what the industry has seen before. And because that safety was better, because that safety was so improved, patients were able to stay on therapy and it led to a survival duration, uh, progression-free survival um, of triple to quadruple that of the standard of care in this specific uh, tumor type called liposarcoma, and that's our lead indication. So triple to quadruple that of standard chemotherapies that are approved by the FDA. So again, this goes back to this concept of if you have a safe drug, patients can take it <laughs> and they can stay on therapy. It's as simple as that. And that's why we're really excited about this specific therapy, a potent uh, inhibitor, but, uh, but because of those molecular properties where it can, it can not accumulate in tissues, it can be adopted in, the, in a regimen that is beneficial for the patient. So that is, that is the mechanism of the drug and that's the biology we're playing in. Um, and uh, Jim, to get to your other question about the recent data that we presented, we just presented at the World Conference of Lung Cancer, uh, new in vitro and, and uh, preclinical data that shows an additional opportunity, not in liposarcoma, but in other tumor types. Since we licensed the program, we're now in our hands at RAIN able to put this drug in various new cancer models where there's also wild type P53. And first, and for the first time, begin to evidence the opportunity beyond our lead indication of liposarcoma. So we, uh, this data was uh, presented by Dr. Lynn Heasley from the University of Colorado. And uh, based on work that he did, he showed that our therapy um, was very effective in non-clinical models, not in patients yet, in, uh, in patients with mesothelioma, um, a different uh, type of tumor than in, than in uh, liposarcoma. So we, are, we control uh, global rights of this program. Uh, today, we have one pivotal phase three study uh, ongoing in liposarcoma. We have previously gotten to the street towards starting a second trial um, in a basket study, in a tumor agnostic study. So across all patients with a certain degree of, uh, of MDM2 gene amplification. I, I can explain more about that in a moment. Um, and then a third study, we're also gonna start an intimal sarcoma, another rare tumor type. So those are three studies that we've guided for to start in the very near future. And we're, we're planning on running all of those. The data we presented at the World uh, Conference of Lung Cancer is not uh, a study that we have articulated attentions to start a, a clinical trial uh, in the near future. We may, uh, but we have not, uh, we have not uh, publicly articulated those plans just yet. We are in the process of generating more non-clinical data across these different tumor types since now that we are, we are the sponsor of the molecule, we're able to actually apply, apply the program to a variety of opportunities that, that Daiichi Sankyo had never previously looked at. Um, the first three studies that we intend to begin, one of them ongoing, we're looking at MDM2 gene amplification. So we talked about how cancers can actually increase MDM2. One of the way cancer cells do this is by amplifying the gene. There's more copies and they use this as a way to, to, to lead to cancer. So we can actually look for MDM2 gene amplification genetically through a variety of, of assay providers. Next generation sequencing assays all actually will, will detect uh, an amplification of the MDM2 gene. And MDM2 amplification, gene amplification, is, is a clear way to denote that that tumor cell uh, and that cancer has dependence on MDM2. That's the first biomarker. Um, this, there's other biomarkers because while the cancer cell may amplify the MDM2 gene, other biomarkers are where there may be a deletion of another gene that typically leads to a product that regulates MDM2. So MDM2 is controlled by a variety of, of, of factors. And if the cell has lost one of those regulators, 
it can also create a dependence on MDM2. So in the case of mesothelioma, uh, there is another gene called CDKN2A. It's a, it's a mouthful, <laughs> CDKN2A. And CDKN2A encodes for a protein called P14ARF. P14ARF regulates MDM2. So if there's no P14ARF around, then the cell can become, again, dependent on MDM2. So that's the second biomarker, uh, is loss of this gene CDKN2A. Thank you.